invest only in a handful of companies across various uh, sectors. Our 70% liquid net worth is also invested in the same strategy as that of our clients. So we have a lot of skin in the game. This is a purely educational webinar and no part of this is to be taken as a stock recommendation. Before we get started, I'm requesting all the participants to mute their mics and please post your queries uh, whenever it is in the chat box and Bowen shall answer them either during the webinar or towards the end. Once again, we welcome you all. Over to you, Bowen. Thank you, Priya. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I welcome all of you. Um, I think we're very happy to have you. It's the 10th webinar of ours. Officially, we would have done so many. In fact, Priya is the inspiration. Priya has been telling me to do this education session in the pandemic last year. And since then, I think we have determined to 100 sessions. And primarily, do we do the sessions for ourselves while we read a lot and we would like to share the wisdom of sages or these investor, legendary investors. Uh, when I share it with you and you ask me questions, I think our learning really enhanced. So let's move forward uh, since I think uh, time is a limitation. Uh, we have our president of Dubai, India and Mauritius from the office perspective. Our clients are throughout the Middle East. We have people from Kuwait. We have people from Oman, Australia, uh, Singapore. Also, we have clientele. We are a six years old company. Uh, in terms of client first group, uh, we started from a small, a humble beginning from home, and then we took a two member team of, uh, and we took a small office. We can just use everybody else. Yeah. Done. So um, then we were more of a broker. We were helping clients with their insurance, and we were helping them with their private banking assets, where we have been primarily giving them bonds and then funds and then structure notes and some stock recommendations. And in the interim, what happened, the one thing was, which never changed was client has to be first. We, you know, many bankers who keep sh shifting the banks. I can tell you, I have a, a customer here who's 11 years with me. He's like father to me, Mr. Ramesh is uh, there online. I'm very happy to help him uh, in his retirement ages to make money. But what I have not understood in my life that how to just make money for myself and sell you something and get out, which I cannot do. That philosophy has helped me to always look at a product which is beneficial to both the party. I have, uh, I'm a private equity investor myself. I have also invested in the equity products of other fund managers, which has given me enough wisdom and uh, uh, what do you call learning, which I am applying on my founder's portfolio. Uh, through Ramji, so I will come to the next part of it. So we, our vision is to become a global startup. We want to reduce the wealth gap in the society. So we have two parts of the business. One where we cater to the HNI who are already a millionaire and they want their wealth to grow. They are primarily investing into property or bonds. We are trying to take them from there to the stock market or the investments which can make them good money. The second part of our business is where we are creating HNI where we have these individuals who are working in a company in a senior position and they have been investing with the insurance company's products, which is like an endowment policy or like a insurance company in India where they are get, get, getting this guaranteed investment returns, but they fail to beat the inflation. And since they fail to beat the inflation, they're not making money. So we are educating them a lot and we are helping them to retire with at least a million to $2 million in the next 15 to 20 years. And they are now... Uh, realizing after investing in property for so long or fixed deposit or gold that the money is not being made. So our mission is to create those HNIs and not just to maintain the HNIs wealth. We also would like to save the retail investors because the investing world is very complex or it has been made complex by my colleagues and my peers. And I'm not blaming anybody else. I think even investors want quick returns and there is nothing called freelance in this world. We all know it. And our commitment is for every employee of this company is a client to me and I need to serve them. If I serve them pretty much better, they will serve the clients. If you are part of our thought for the day, we have changed our thought for the day. And for the last one week, we are sending the thoughts inclined towards the employee growth. So welcome you all. I open this session for all of you to listen and learn from the serious wisdom. I repeat, this is all education session one. 
second whatever wisdom we are sharing it's going to be uh, the uh, warren buffet or peter lynch or benjamin graham's wisdom so this session is unique we are decoding the 10th annual meeting of berkshire hathaway it's a company which is a holding company and has got more than 40 plus investments in some of the companies they are uh, they have basically their subsidiary in some of the companies they are minority shareholders and that's how they are managing this 40 companies they have a significant uh, uh, position in a company called gaico which is g e i c o where mr ajit jain is the one of the vice chairman and uh, this company is underwriting lot of the insurance risk they have a non insurance business where they own railroad and they also own energy business where they are basically a power transmission company and that is run by greg now these two companies uh, these two are the uh, uh, the next in command after charlie munger so let's talk about benjamin graham first benjamin graham is warren buffet's guru benjamin graham wrote two books security analysis and the intelligent investor let me remind you that even the mba colleges don't teach these books so he is the founder of the value investing warren buffet at the age of 11 years started investing and he was has was uh, fortunate to learn from him in the early age of his life he was a stock broker and i think 6 7 8 years he worked there and then he stopped working there and he wanted to work with benjamin graham benjamin graham was not very keen but he keeps and he kept sending him the stock advice the uh, rational and the analysis and one fine day benjamin graham allowed him to work with him uh warren buffet is a son of a us congressman i think he does not need any introduction he is a uh, top 10 riches in the world uh, as you can see that top 60 companies is what uh, are under his belt uh, his returns for last uh, 60 plus year is 1800 times so if somebody has invested a million dollar with him roughly 50 years ago he has made converted that into 1.8 billion dollar and counting his his turning 90 his partner let's talk about his partner who is even more uh, you know, people call him is also one of the best in the world which is less spoken about i think i will run a session for him also one day uh, he is the vice chairman of the holding company called bakshar hathwe his name is charlie mango he is 94 years old and he has also one of the darling stock which he i think he has recommended to warren buffet is costco it's a us retail giant and uh, he is his partner they both i uh, have uh, come along a long way uh, i came to know about them from a gentleman called ramdev agrawal who is the joint md of motilal oswal uh, we belong to same city why i keep referring to this thing because once you have somebody who is a legend and he's from your own city it really makes you think that why the hell i don't know about what uh, these guys do because i have always a passion to make money honestly and i think the stock market is a great tool where i can make money honestly for myself and for my clients ramdev agrawal is a very down to earth person he keeps uh, referring to mangar and warren buffet in his uh, address he is also one person who has made roughly 4000 crores uh, only by investing in the stock market in the last 30 years ramdev agrawal needs a, a special mention in my life because ramdev agrawal has given me a mantra to invest in the stock and his mantra is invest when you have the money and withdraw the money the day you need the money so whenever he gets some dividend or some income he does not even wait for the next day and he keeps investing in the same portfolio that's the very good way of investing because timing you might be correct in the 3 or 6 months scenario but over a period of 20 years whether you bought a stock at $5 or $10 or $20 if the stock is a growth company which can substantially grow in the next 10 20 years then i think the short term prices are of no importance so that's why ramdev agrawal needs a special mention now coming to the annual gen general meeting of bakshar hathway uh, i have divided the learning into four parts i will not be able to cover all of them instead of me talking what we will do is i will run the live videos for you and we all will be listening then i will summarize that in a minute or two what a, what a great learning we're going to get is esg investing which i'm going to cover we'll also cover on the growth stock valuation a lot of customers who call me and say that they're worried about the valuation some of them are sitting outside 
with a million or two million dollars they want to re-enter and they're not able to figure out why stock market is not crashing. So for them, it's very important and we will cover that in the second uh, part of this. A uh, lot of people, I think they invest in cryptocurrency. So we will also listen to the frank opinion of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett on cryptocurrency. Uh, China, I think after the Alibaba fiasco and a lot of issues which we have seen lately in China where they are clamping down on the, on the debt, uh, we will also hear about China and whether China will be a success story from here or not from Charlie Munger and uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, we will cover inflation outlook, which is very important. Inflation is a, something which is everybody is worried and I'm sure we can see that prices are going high every day. Freights have become four times. Shipping has also gone three times. So the huge, huge dent on the pocket of a consumer. And I don't think so fixed deposit or bonds or properties have any way, any way they can match these phenomenal um, uh, price rise which is happening. We'll also talk about some business les lesson and the con fund. So there is something called a con fund. I will cover briefly about what is a con fund. And then there's something called buy and hold strategy. A lot of investors right nowadays call me, if you are my, uh, my funds investor, let me tell you, uh, as of now, I have a stock which has become seven times in the last one year. And I'm very, very fortunate to have that company. And uh, I have not sold that company yet. And I have, uh, I've, I've been immensely pressurized by my very good investors. My good friends were saying that, please sell the stock. And I think the stock has still a lot of upside and I'm not going to sell it. So I think the buy and hold strategy is really going to help them to understand that why I'm not keen on selling. We'll also talk about business lessons. I think a lot of us are a business, um, um, business person. We run a small company or let's say a company of 50 or 100 people. What we need to grow up to, I, I think I'm talk, talking about myself, I want to grow to an organization where everything is decentralized and everybody understand their responsibility. So we'll also look at the business lesson, which is decentralization along with the right work culture. And at that note, I will finish it. And I will leave uh, uh, this recording and this presentation for you to, if you have a keen interest on the other subject. And inflation outlook is definitely I'm going to cover. So let's now start with ESG investing. It's a big subject. Today, everybody is uh, looking at investing in green technology. So I have already uh, uh, shortlisted these things for you. And now I'm going to play it. Please listen very carefully. And I will summarize everything in a minute. And then we'll move forward. So, And there will be some ad here and there. So please pardon me for that. I'll try to uh, avoid the ad or pause the ad. Now, we are discussing ESG investing. Before I go to take you to the meeting, let me explain to you this year, the meeting happened in LA, Los Angeles. Warren Buffet, Charlie Munger, Ajit Jain and Greg, they were, they were present. And there are some managers who were present, which we couldn't see. This lady is Miss Becky from CNBC. And she, she covers uh, every time uh, these, the AGM happens, she takes the questions from the audience. Audience is gonna ask some very good questions on our behalf and that's going to be a great learning next year if the pandemic is not going to affect my request to you is that please visit uh, and and go and join the annual meet i will be there i could not go last year because of the pandemic but this is going to be the lifetime learning i think no mba or no education will help you but this will help you a lot of lot of millennials and billionaires come there and join them 40000 people generally come over there in the agm and they ask questions or they learn from other questions. It's a great time to meet people and draw the inferences. So let's start with the ESG investing. This question comes from Andrew Dixon in, in the UK. He says, my question is in relation to the oil and gas business and your purchase of Chevron stock. When being asked a question on tobacco stocks in 1997, you mentioned that individuals and companies well, can't see the video. lines second, about yeah. what they're willing to do. One you stated at the time that you were not comfortable in making a big commitment in tobacco stocks and that you were uncomfortable about their... One second. Now the video is visible. Can you see the screen now? Yeah. yeah. Can everybody see the screen now? Can, it, can we see Ms. Becky on the screen? Yes, Bowen. Okay, thank you. Specs. Charlie has also referenced passing up on a private tobacco deal. So, um, 
I'm again running the question again. Okay. Next is one, uh, but it's it's a tiny portion, but it'll be it'll be her livelihood, and she'll have all the money she needs, and way beyond it, and that's that. And but the I don't I don't mind having the ninety nine point seven percent large portion of it, if it assuming that laws are the same as now total finance rate to be uh uh to be kept in berkshire until they finally are disposed of so now the question starts on esg investing please listen carefully this question comes from Andrew Dixon in, in the UK. He says, my question is in relation to the oil and gas business and your purchase of Chevron stock. When being asked a question on tobacco stocks in 1997, you mentioned that individuals and companies occasionally have to draw moral lines about what they're willing to do. You stated at the time that you were not comfortable in making a big commitment in tobacco stocks and that you were uncomfortable about their prospects. Charlie has also referenced passing up on a private tobacco deal that you both knew was a cinch, yet you both have no regrets in saying no to the transaction. I'm not suggesting that the oil and gas business has the same known negative externalities as cigarettes. They do not. With tobacco, the cause and effect relationship between the products and cancer is direct, obvious, and measurable. With hydrocarbons, the societal costs and benefits are far more complex to evaluate. However, an increasing portion of society is drawing their lines in such a way that their painting does not include hydrocarbons, period. My question is, has the alarmism from the climate community now become pervasive across society to the extent it has become irrational? Have we built our own unrealistic consensus on the pace of change achievable with regards to the transition to greener energy sources to the extent that this is becoming an overly expensive tax worn by the current younger generation? Can we gather from your purchase of Chevron stock that you do not believe the howling from society, regulators and politicians will impair the prospects of hydrocarbons and Chevron for that matter in the next 10 years? Can investors still assume an oil and gas business that finds and produces oil at low cost per barrel can generate a sufficient return on capital for a long time to come? Well, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a 10 word answer to that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember all the questions that were there, but I would say that people that are on the extremes of both sides are, are a little nuts. <laughs> I, I, I would hate to have all hydrocarbons banned in three years or and you, you know you wouldn't want a world it wouldn't work and on the other hand you know what's happening will be adapted to over time just as we've adapted to, to all kinds of things i do not think I, I'm, I'm interested in a quote from 1997 because uh you know we've talked about this before we have no problem owning costco or walmart you know and, and a substantial number of their stores and uh, you know, they, they sell cigarettes. It's a big item. You know, it's, it's it's something that brings people in. They know the price of cigarettes, and and uh, you know, they put them up front. And uh, so we don't. Uh, it's a very tough situation. We made that decision a long time ago when we went to Memphis, and and we looked at a business that was a very very good business, and it was much less harmful, uh, at least from everything I could find out. Uh, it was much less harmful than smoking tobacco, chewing tobacco was. And these were decent people and they were running a legal business and they all chewed tobacco themselves. So they, they, when they were, and they, they told me that their mother was honored and chewing tobacco and all these things. But Charlie and I did go down in the lobby of that hotel and we just said to ourselves, this is probably the best business we've ever seen. Uh, and I called my then son-in-law, Alan Greenberg, and he, he'd studied chewing tobacco and its effects when he was working for uh, a native related organization and, and we decided not to do it, but you know, would we, you know, I see, I used to see ads in our paper from financial companies where I knew they were terrible. You know, and I, uh, it's, it's a very tough thing to decide whether you get in or out of a business. It's a very tough time to decide what, what companies benefit society more than others. I mean, it's, I don't know whether, I think Chevron's benefited society in all kinds of ways, and I think it continues to do so. And I think we're going to need a lot of hydrocarbons for a long time, and we'll be very glad we've got them. But I do think that the world's moving away from them too, and then uh, that could change. Uh, I, I, I don't like making the moral judgments on stocks in terms of actually running the businesses, but there's something about every business that 
you know what you wouldn't like. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, meat packers or anything. Have you ever gone through a meat packing? <laughs> you know, it, there's, it, it, if you expect perfection, you know, in your spouse or in your friends or in companies, you're not going to find it. And and uh, what you elect to do yourself, if you own an index fund, you're going to own. And believe me, Chevron is not an evil company in the least. <laughs> and and, and uh, I have no compunction about owning, in the least about owning Chevron. And if if we own the entire business, I wouldn't I would not feel uncomfortable about being in that business. Charlie? Well, I agree. I, I, you know, you can imagine two things. A young man marries into your family. He's a English professor at, say, Swarthmore, or he's a, he works for Chevron. Which would you pick? Because I don't see. I want to admit I'd take the guy from Chevron. <laughs> so... Uh, you saw that Charlie Munger was actually very uh, frank about it. Let me explain the question to you. In a very nutshell manner, uh, the one of the shareholders is asking that last uh, uh, time in 1997, you did not invest in tobacco company mm -hmm. as a Berkshire Hathaway company. And today you are investing in the oil company. He's saying, I understand they are not both correlation, but oil segment is also a very, very harmful to the society, like oil gets spilled over or oil is detrimental to society. I think after this coronavirus, people have really gone nuts and they really, and they may be correct also, and they all want companies like electric vehicles, etc. But what we are not able to understand that electric vehicles use more of a copper, they use more of cobalt, they use more of a plastic, because every plastic is made of hydrocarbon. So they need more of this, basically. So the question has been asked uh, to Warren Buffet and everybody on the stage that, do you think you should also um, uh, promote ESG investing? So he said, uh, I understand that ESG investing is a big business and uh, every company is taking the right step. But I don't think so that in three years, Chevron or the companies like these will be dead. Now, what does that mean for an investor that don't mix the morality with business. For example, I met somebody and he said that I do not want to invest in, in any company which is selling liquor. So I said, I understand your point, but then are you saying that you will not invest in Amazon because Amazon also sell liquor or meat? And he said, yes, I don't want to invest in Amazon. So basic challenge I think here is that if we will miss the, will mix the model with the investing, it will be very, very difficult. And it has not been said by me, it is said by various fund managers and if something is ethical and legal, uh, because even Costco or Amazon or any retail giant is selling cigarette, and I'm against the cigarette, by the way, personally, or smoking, but then should I not invest in this business? Because what he's saying that everybody who is coming to, the, uh, to buy a cigarette is an adult person, and he understands that what harm, harm it can cause to them. So that's what he said, and he said, yes, ESG is a big field, but don't go crazy and buy the company at any valuation and it is going to be the future. So that's what Warren Buffett said. Charlie Munger, I don't think so. I have to explain. He said, if you wanted to marry your daughter, uh, you will marry an English professor or will you marry somebody who is working in Chevron as a senior position? So obviously, I leave you to uh, think about very pun intended answer he gave. Uh, now let's talk, let's go to the next question. The next question is about, uh, one second. So the next question is about uh, the yeah, that's a very important topic. Now I'm gonna cover. It's about the zero interest rate, and it's about the growth investing. So basically, a lot of us think that these stocks, which are the Apple of the world and the Google of the world, are highly priced. And I think it's a very apt answer. It's gonna be a longer answer. Please attune to it. I'll try and explain it after the answer. But ask a follow-up question on that, then. This comes from Jack. One second. I think I have to share the video with you. Bang, who says, what's your mindset when you see so many of these high flyers, not the GME or meme stocks, but more like the big tech growth stocks gaining 50%, 100%, 200%, et cetera, in a matter of a year or less? I know you eventually bought Apple in 2016 because of the quality of their businesses and their management. 
how do you assess if these high flyers are worthy of your investment given this crazy high valuations that muddy the waters? Well, we don't think they're crazy. <laughs> they, uh, but we don't, at least I, I'm Charlie, I, I feel uh, that I understand Apple and its future with consumers around the world uh, better than I understand some of the others. But I don't regard uh, prices, and that gets back. Uh, well, it gets, it, it, it gets back to something fundamental in investments. I mean, uh, interest rates, you know, basically are to uh, to uh, the value of assets what gravity is to matter. You know, essentially. And and uh, on the way out here, uh, I tore out a little clipping from the Wall Street Journal yesterday, probably the only one that read it, so small, I'm having trouble finding it. But anyway, yes, on Thursday, the U.S. Treasury sold some eight-week, some four-week notes, uh, Treasury bills, uh, and the price was in, if you looked at your Wall Street Journal down a little corner, next to the last page in my paper, in the very bottom corner, uh, the here it is. The results of the Treasury auction, a little tiny thing. Uh, they sold four. They had applications on the on the four week Treasury bill for a hundred and some billion. They accepted bids for 40, 43 billion worth, and it says average. Average price, one hundred point zero 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 six zeros, and essentially, people were giving forty some billion dollars to the treasury, and they offered to give one hundred and thirty billion or something, whatever the amount tendered. And the treasury received the money at zero, uh, and Janet Yellen has talked a couple of times about. The reduced carrying cost of the debt. Uh, the, I think in the last fiscal quarter, the U.S. Treasury, which the uh, U.S. government, which owes a few billion, few trillion dollars, I should say, a few trillion dollars more than a year ago, their interest expense was down eight percent. So you've had this incredible reduction in the so-called super risk-free uh, group, the short-term Treasury bill. And that is the yardstick against which other values are, are, are measured. I mean, if 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 I could reduce gravity's pull by about 80%, I mean, I'd be in the Tokyo Olympics uh, jumping. <laughs> and essentially, if interest rates were 10%, valuations are much higher. So you've had this incredible uh, change in the valuation of everything that produces money because the risk-free rate produces really short enough right now nothing it's very interesting i, I brought this book along because uh for 25 or more years paul samuelson's book was the definitive book on economics it was taught in every school and and paul was a he was the first he was the first nobel uh, prize winner uh, it's sort of a cousin to the Nobel Prize. They started giving it in economics, uh, uh, I think, in the late 60s. He was the first winner from the United States, Paul Samuelson. Uh, uh, amazingly enough, the second winner uh, was Ken Arrow, and both of them are the uncles of Larry Summers. <laughs> Larry Summers had the first two winners as uncles. Uh, but Paul, he was a wonderful guy, he was a wonderful writer, the definitive writer, and uh, so I got out the 73 economics book, and bear in mind, probably economics kind of started in, as kind of an interesting science and respect, but with Adam Smith, we'll say, you know, he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and he'd written some books earlier, but it sort of dated from kind of when our country started, and then you had all these famous economists subsequently, and Paul became the most famous of his time, so I looked up in the back under interest rates. I looked for negative interest rates. There's nothing there. So I finally found zero interest rates. And Paul Samuelson, 
brilliant man after a couple hundred years we've had of kind of studying economics basically he said that uh, uh he said you can conceivably technically he said you can conceive perhaps of negative interest rates but it can't ever really happen and that so just to pause guys here that negative interest rate might not happen as per warren buffett the big big line he's saying so interest rate like in unlike europe may not go back in the us as ne- negative i think the one reason behind is the biggest debtor is the us government itself unlike japan so what happened the moment the interest rate goes negative the government has to pay government will not we will not be keeping money in the us dollar because all of us have to basically pay uh, pay on our money which we keep with the us government whether through the rbi or through banks or whatever so negative interest might not be a phenomenon in the us you know in the 1970s this wasn't back in the dark ages and this was a and no economist wrote up and said this is a terrible line to have in a book or anything you know and here we are in this world where we had zero interest rates last year out of i mean last week on a, or this week out of on a four four week note and Berkshire Hathaway which had a has more than this but let's say we had 100 billion dollars in mm-hmm. in treasury bills we have more than that before the van- epidemic uh pandemic we were getting about a billion and a half from that a year at present rates if it's two basis points we get 20 million imagine you're your wage is going from $15 a an hour to 20 cents an hour so uh, it it's been a sea change and it was designed to be that i mean it was uh, that's why the fed moved the way they did they wanted to give a massive push just like mario draghi did in europe and whatever it was 2012 when he says whatever it takes and they they went to negative rates and uh we Fed said it doesn't want to go to negative rates and I think the treasury actually has got some small bar up but but if you, if present rates were destined to be appropriate if the 10 years should really be at the price it is those companies that the fellow mentioned in this question they're they're, they're bargaining I mean, they they have the ability to deliver cash at a rate that's if you discount it back uh and you're discounting at present interest rates stocks are very very cheap now the question is what in so that is one something very important for all the people who are sitting outside uh, it's not a stock recommendation i am not saying that you should come for a small short period but stocks are dirt cheap because interest rates are zero and that is making the look microsoft apple google kind of companies very cheap i'll give you a very simple example so i put 100 dollar today in the bank i am only getting 50 cents or let's say 0.2 of uh, 25 cents which is roughly my return on the capital is roughly 0.25% but if i give the same money to google or apple or amazon of the world so the microsoft i might earn 3 or 4% return on my capital assuming that i am a part owner of the company so if let's say i i invest in amazon i and i buy the company for full my investment will ha- have to be 1.6 trillion and the return which i'm going to get is roughly a 200 or let's say a 100 or 80 80 billion so 80 billion on 1.6 trillion is roughly 4% and that's written on capital or free cash flow also we can calculate based on the investment so that's why he's saying that stocks these big companies are relatively cheap now the question is where the interest rate will go let's hear him out it's due over time but there's a view of what interest rates will be based in the yield curve out to 30 years and you know so on it's it's a it's a fascinating time we've never really seen what shoveling money in on the basis that we're doing it on a on a uh, a fiscal basis while following a monetary policy of something close to zero interest rates and it is enormously pleasant but in economics there's one thing always to remember you could you can never do one thing you always have to say and then what and we're sending out huge sums i mean president said it on wednesday 85% of the people 
we're going to get a fourteen hundred dollar check you know uh, 85 percent and a couple of years ago we were saying 40 percent of the people couldn't never could come up with four hundred dollars of cash so we've got 85 percent of the people getting those sums and so far we've had no unpleasant consequences from it i mean people feel better uh, the people who get the money feel better and and people who are lending money don't feel very good but it causes stocks to go up it causes business to flourish it causes an electorate to be happy and uh, we'll see if it causes anything else and if it doesn't cause anything else you can count on it continuing in a very big way but there, there are consequences to everything in economics but that is that is why the googles and the apples when we don't own Google, we don't own microsoft we don't, but they are incredible companies in terms of what they re earn on capital they don't require a lot of capital and they gush out more money and if you're trying to find bonds that gush out market more money from the federal government we got 100 billion that's gushing out <laughs> like you know 30 or 40 million dollars a year or whatever it may be depending on the charge so this point i want to explain uh, very important i don't know whether you know this or not the berkshire hathaway has roughly 145 billion dollar lying in cash on their balance sheet where their net worth is roughly 600 billion dollar the cash component of that is 145 billion dollar one year ago they were getting roughly 1 to 1.25 billion dollar as an interest every year but since the interest rates have become uh, close to zero, now on the hundred billion dollar, their income has become fifty million dollar. You can imagine that the loss is nine hundred fifty million dollar plus on the cash, and that's what has exactly happened in with the people who were holding the bonds earlier, because bonds, fixed deposit, everything has uh, taken a beating. I'll give you an example. Interactive brokers as a as a lender broker has has lost 500 million dollar of income which they were earning on the interest they have recovered from somewhere else but on the plain lending basis on a margin lending basis they lost 500 million dollar of income last year okay right uh, so that puts the pressure on which is exactly of course what the monetary authorities want done i mean that's they're, they're pushing <laughs> the economy in a and they're doing in Europe you know, even more extreme and they're pushing and we're aiding it with fiscal policy and people feel good and and people will become numb to numbers you know trillions don't mean anything to anybody you know uh, uh, and uh, and fourteen hundred dollars does mean something to them <laughs> so we'll see where it all leads but it's Charlie and I consider it the most interesting movie by far we've ever seen in terms of economic stuff like Yes, and the professional economists, of course, have been very surprised by what's happened. It reminds me of what Churchill said about Clement Attlee. He said he was a very modest man and had a great deal to be modest about. And that's exactly what's happened with the professional economists. You know, they were so confident about everything. And it turns out the world is more complicated than, than they thought. As a follow-up to that, Pat King. So I will summarize this to you in a very simple manner. That first of all, a lot of people have got this four hundred dollar, uh, and and sorry, four hundred dollar basically. And a lot of these people actually have not received this money earlier. So one thing which is very important that a lot of people got the money and they are very happy. Their electorate, electorate. When the electorate is happy. The government is able to keep things very, very rosy. Now he's saying that even I do not know what will be the negative consequences and we will see what negative consequences can happen. But right now there is no negative consequences and the stock are going up because people are buoyant, they're buying. We will see if there's a negative consequences. So even he's not aware. So some years ago, they were talking that 40% people might not be even get $400 a month kind of an income where they have suddenly got $1,400. So that is the kind of impact which has happened. And that has led the, the good stock, the great stock still feel very cheap in the valuation, which essentially means that we will have a great run of the stock market 
from the main i think we had some good run out so there is a still chance and upside and and room left in the stock market okay now if you have any question go ahead and ask me on this if because it might have become a little complicated and then we'll move to the next topic of cryptocurrency i think a lot of people would like to ask about cryptocurrency sir please go ahead ask a question hello anybody has any question so far uh, yeah hi can you hear me yes i can so good name uh, uh, bhuvan ankit here Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was actually driving. I couldn't. Uh, uh, did you say he has a hundred and forty-five billion in cash and another hundred billion in uh, treasury bonds? No, no. I said he has he has hundred forty-five billion dollar cash. Cash okay. itself means in treasury. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. right. So that Agreed. that money used to earn him a billion dollar last year. If you go but to the but now earns him about fifty million. Yeah, because I'm I'm sure you know that interest rates for the the two percent right. and half percent now become roughly point zero point zero two zero point zero eight percent. It's a big big loss actually. It's a big Agreed. change, Agreed. sea change basically. And in the same time, the people who could not even think of earning four hundred dollar a year uh, a month, they have got a check of fourteen hundred dollar a month, and they are very happy. and since the interest rate so he is saying that what interest rate is to the valuation is what gravity is to the um, uh, what call the weight of things so basically what he is trying to say that yeah, if interest rates have gone down stock price to earning of 40 is also cheap because you need to really see that if you invest in a great company like amazon google or apple they are more like owning the us itself and the treasury you are getting only 0.5 why don't you Look into investing in these companies. Okay, I have one more question. Did I answer your question, by the way? Yes, yes, Bhuvan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bhuvan, there is a question. Yes, sir. Uh, by uh, yeah. Sachin. Yeah, Sachin, you are absolutely correct. But I will not present my views today. And I think we have the last topic is inflation. So he has clearly said that even I want. It is a fantastic movie I am seeing in my my life. And then Charlie Munger added that also in the professional economy. economics so i'll say that i am not going to give my input here let's wait till the last point when i am going to present the inflation outlook of warren buffett it's all as per their point of view today's meeting is to make you familiar with these people i am a peanut to give any uh, um, uh, suggestion or any advice on what they are saying i will do what i have to do in my investments but today i am not going to speak on what they have said i'm just trying to explain this you all could have listened to charlie munger and warren buffett but timing is odd the language is also sometime you are more familiar to me maybe the way we conduct is 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 okay to you guys uh, so what i'm saying is i'm not going to present my personal view on top of what they've done okay. we will cover the inflation in the end okay so uh, anything over high is over high is rasha just a question yeah, in terms of uh, interest rates right so obviously he talked about <clears throat> now the interest rates are zero negative but we are hearing right that the interest rates are going to go up right So, yes, very, very, yes. so what's his slash your view that when the interest rates do go up, what happens? Okay, so I'll not present my view as of now. I'll do it in the end. He he does said that from thirty years yield curve, you can figure out what will happen to the interest rate. My personal opinion, Rashid, you know it. I have already discussed with you. But today's session, just hold on. Let's hear from him. Definitely, there could be a scenario where the interest rates will go up. but that has that is not what my job is it will go up surely one day but when that's the question and i think that question has to be addressed to the uh, janet gallen and i am not the one who uh, put it on the interest rate let's move to the next question which is cryptocurrency and uh, please keep it to the bakshar hathway agm interpretation but definitely i'll come back to on the interest rate question in the end so now the next question is cryptocurrency be ready i am sure um 90% of my audience is owns cryptocurrency or want to own the cryptocurrency person either stays in the textile business or the department store business and expands uh, and uh you know i've looked at a lot of businesses and that's what's caused the number one problem and it isn't the kind of thing where they list them all because the lawyers tell them to list them the question goes now Uh, this question comes from Raghu Bashwal, and it's for both Warren and Charlie. Now that the crypto market overall is valued at two trillion dollars, do you still consider cryptos as worthless artificial gold? <laughs> well, I, I knew there'd be a question on 
bit quieter. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, well, I've watched these politicians dodge questions all the time, you know, and, and, and uh, I always find it kind of disgusting when they do it. But the truth is, I'm going to dodge that question because the, <laughs> we probably got hundreds of thousands of people watching this that own Bitcoin. And we probably got two people that are short. So we got a choice of making 400,000 people mad at us and unhappy and or making two people happy. And that's just a dumb equation. So I, I thought about it. We had, we had a governor one time in, in uh, Nebraska and a uh, long time ago, but uh, he would get a tough question. You know, what do you think about property taxes or, you know, what should we do about schools? And, and he'd look right at the person he'd say, I'm all right on that one. <laughs> and just walk off. Well, I'm all right on that one. And maybe we'll see how Charlie is. <laughs> well, those who know me well are just waving the red flag of the bull. <laughs> of course, I hate the Bitcoin success. And I don't welcome a currency that's so useful and the kidnappers and extortionists and so forth, nor do I like just shuffling out a few extra billions and billions and billions of dollars to somebody who just invented a new financial product out of thin air. So I think I should say modestly that I think the whole damn development is disgusting and contrary to the interests of civilization. And I'll let, leave the criticism to others. <laughs> I'm all right on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the view on cryptocurrency. I hope you've understood. If you've not, I can summarize it. So uh, he ducked the question. He gave a very good example that there was a uh, Senate and or there was a governor and they always ask about the taxation and he always said, I'm all right on that one. He doesn't reply. He said, many of the audience, see the good, good thing I want to tell you is that look at the wisdom of these guys, they know the audience is owning the cryptocurrency. And it took time for me to realize that everybody I'm talking to in Dubai or in Mauritius or in India or in China or in Middle East are somewhere owning Bitcoin. The whole city today, I can tell you the textile market, everybody is long on Bitcoin. And I can bet you, if you'll ask out of 10 people, hardly one guy can explain you Bitcoin. I really don't understand that at one point of time, we are saying stock market is very risky. So we will like go for FD and property and gold. And suddenly we say, let's stock market, let's pause it. That's a gambling thing. And then we go to Bitcoin and I don't know what's really going on in our mind. And I'm no one to comment. I still think Bitcoin is, a, uh, is not in my top list to, to study. And I think my job is to make you 15, 20%. But I think you got an answer that what he's not ready, Charlie Munger is not ready to pay. He's saying that out of a thin air, if you invent something, I'm not ready to give you a billion dollars. By the way, I don't know how many of you know about Elon Musk uh, going towards Bitcoin and Dogecoin and then dodging it itself and saying that uh, they are really not ESG friendly. Yes, I think in my opinion, crypto and the blockchain is a great, great innovation. What value do you put to it? I am not sure about it. But yes, they have speed and they have uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call the secrecy, which is also against it. So I will recommend you to hear Jim Rogers on his view on cryptocurrency and it will help you out. So I'll move on to the next question on China. So what has happened? The background of China is that Alibaba has been scrutinized for their IPO on end group. And that has been uh, a sharp uh, contract people have really got scared so i had investor who's telling me invest in china invest in china invest in china and then for suddenly when he had this alibaba stock and the stock really uh, took a beating because of what has happened and even china is also clamping down on the debt right now on the credit market so what was the china's future and that's the question somebody's asked and these people have answered so let's look into that so Charlie, it comes from Stephen Tetter in Atlanta. He's been a Berkshire shareholder for 10 years and says, 
you and your, your friend Li Lu have been very optimistic with respect to investing opportunities in China. BYD has performed spectacularly for Berkshire since its initial purchase in 2008 and is currently valued at $5.8 billion. The Daily Journal recently bought a large position in Alibaba after founder Jack Ma had been reprimanded by the Chinese Communist Party and Ma's other company, Ant, was not allowed to proceed with its IPO. What are your current thoughts on China and whether the communist leaders will allow businesses with strong leadership to flourish in decades to come? Well, I think that, uh, that the Chinese government will allow businesses to flourish. It was a, one of the most remarkable things that ever happened in the history of the world when a bunch of committed communists just looked at the prosperity of places like Singapore and said, the hell with this, we're not going to stay here in poverty. We're going to copy what works. And they changed communism. They just accepted Adam Smith and added it to their communism. And said, now we have communism with Chinese characteristics, which is China with a free market with a bunch of billionaires and so forth. And they made that shift. They deserve a lot of credit. Warren and I are not quite as good at that as changing our minds in many cases. <laughs> yeah. and, and that was a remarkable change coming from such a place. And of course, it's worked like gangbusters. It had this enormous growth in the average income of the average Chinese. They've lifted 800 million people out of poverty fast. And it, it, there was never anything like it in the history of the world. So my hat is off to the Chinese. And I think they will continue to allow people to make money. They've learned it works. The Chinese, I love what the guy said in the first place. I don't care whether the cat is black and white as long as it catches mice. That's my kind of talk. In that list of the 20 most valuable companies, three are Chinese. Now, if you're looking out 30 years, you know, how many do you think will be Chinese? I guess there's more, but uh, but I don't think that, I don't think it'll top the United States. Uh, uh, but who knows? It's it's amazing what what has been accomplished, and and uh, yeah, it really amazing. And they found what works. I mean, there's nothing like finding something that works in order to sort of reinforce ideas over time, and we'll see what happens. So I think it's a it's a big, uh, very big. Uh, comments coming from both the both the sages that China Chinese people are very smart. I don't think so. I have to spend much time on it because all of us are somewhere affected. Uh, a lot of my friends who are supplying the oil containers and the bulk shipping they are they are dependent on China. I read a lot of books and they say copper price is going up because China is importing a lot and. Uh, so and so, and I think the China has become one of the very important uh, thing to discuss and study and read. I think the language is a, one of the big barrier. Uh, China might overtake, as he said, and he was not very, very sure that that will or not. But let me tell you one thing, which I want to. Uh, I think a very important point. I was reading Financial Times. Huawei technology. I'm sure you guys know how US is banning it on day and the night. Even in the UAE. I saw I was in Trade Center and I saw some cameras uh, lugging uh, and some network devices uh, on Zabil Park. And when I went there, I you know I have a habit of researching companies to uh, at a ground level. So if a waste management company, there is a uh, um, equipment on the road or on the side of a building, I'll go and check which company it is. I'll note down that company and I'll go and study that company and look at their financials and all. That's how I pick my stocks. So I saw that that particular company was Huawei Technology. And then I saw uh, in the newspaper, there was a big article which says that China is selling this monitoring technology to a lot of municipalities in the world, where you can not only track the people on their behavior, you can figure out that which kind of people are trying to plan something wrong because of their facial expression and their movements, et cetera. And Chinese companies, I think ZTE and Huawei are leading companies and they're selling these to Europe, et cetera where they are uh, more um, uh, promoting the, uh, the monitoring and uh, the privacy is a big concern right now. Uh, I don't know whether it is correct or, or wrong, but let's understand one more important point which uh, these people have spoken that, first of all, understand that China is a communist nation. Do you know which was, what was the capital of India long, long ago? 
any any guesses which city was the capital of india long long ago before bombay and delhi Kolkata. any guesses hmm kolkata see again kolkata i cannot hear you kolkata kolkata thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot so calcutta is a communist uh, hub jyoti basu uh, ruled for roughly 35 years and it's a communist uh, party a communist uh, place you will find things are so cheap in calcutta and that's why a lot of industries are still there but what has happened is calcutta calcutta couldn't grow because of the communism so what charlie munger was referring that this is a modern communism in china so they have taken some adam smith is a guy who uh, talks about the profitability he said singapore has grown like hell how the hell we we let it happen we will also adopt what singapore has done in china let's copy that and i'm sure we agree that china is a great copycat and china has then copied and added that into communism and there now we have such great millionaires coming out of china we have so many phone brands that have come from china electric cars are coming out of china and china is a great subject so they are very sure that china is going to grow even if there is a clamp down as happen on the alibaba so i think china is a one market which everybody needs to study we have our all imports coming from china today so this is what i think the china they are bullish so if somebody wants to invest into passive funds and all they can just invest in china passive fund i also want to comment here that in the last 10 years chinese currency has appreciated against dollar that's remarkable so uh, nothing uh, uh, on uh, much here but we need to understand that china is a great place which can be a next us but it is possible that china might launch a digital currency nothing much on that let's move to quant fund i want to tell you about something called quant fund there's a guy called jim simons i don't know how many of you know him he's 84 year old and he has got various fund but he has got one particular fund which i am very much interested in and i have also privately launched for some of my investors i'm just trying to tell you about jim simons here and not about the strategy which we have launched jim simons is 84 years old he's 24 billion dollar rich he's got 200 plus physicist on his panel and the astronauts and all they do not take money from public uh, their fund has given phenomenal return and their profit sharing is 5% fixed and 44% profit sharing i'll repeat 5% fixed and 44% profit percent profit sharing let's hear from warren buffett and charlie munger what do they comment about jim simons and their company okay This question comes from BJ Corala. What do you think of quants? Jim Simon's Medallion Fund has done 39% net of fees for 3 decades, which proves that it works. Will you consider hiring a quant lieutenant in Berkshire to work alongside with Ted or Todd? Well, I'll say no to the second part, not what Charlie had the first part. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's rather interesting. The 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 quant fund did fabulously on the short term trading they they found little algorithms that worked to make them they had predictive value and as long as they kept working they just kept doing it as long as the money kept coming in when they got to using the same system just to finding some little algorithm and trying to do it mechanically for long term stock predictions the record was not nearly as good and in the short term stuff they found that if they tried to do it too much they destroyed their own advantage So there was a limit on the amount they could make, but they were very, very smart. Yes, they got very rich. Very, very, very smart. And very smart and very rich. Yeah, and and, and very and, high grade, by the way. Yeah, uh, Jim Simons. And, but uh, we're not we're not trying to make money trading stocks. I mean, no. <laughs> the answer we don't think we know how to do it. I mean, it doesn't. If we knew how to make a lot more money making trading stocks, we'd probably be trading stocks too. But but we we don't know how to do it, and we really don't trust anybody else to do it for us. That's simple. so you saw that they have really have high regard for jim simons i think you should study about jim simons i am studying about him and at the same time that jim simons have done a great job in the field of investing and there are so many good people out there 
and i think the the message i want to give it you to you is that stop thinking about 5 to 7% kind of person uh, i'm not uh, promoting margin i'm not promoting leverage all i'm promoting is that the mindset has to be attuned to think about that we uh, can actually make more than 10 15% if we are prudent or we are with the with the knowledgeable people that is the mindset i want to uh, put in here now we'll discuss the buy and hold strategy of uh, the uh, and what what is the comment they have on buy and hold strategy so let's go to buy and hold strategy which is yeah so a lot of customers tell me that i should be trading the stocks which warren buffett just said that we don't know or and we are not trading also i also don't trade uh, stocks and my um, basic uh, principle lies on warren buffett's ground rule so i do sell a stock when it is become overvalued but i don't trade the stock on a weekly or a monthly or a quarterly basis and that's let's listen to them what are they trying to say record was not nearly as good and in the short term stuff they found that if they tried to do it too much they destroyed their own advantage so there was a limit on the amount they could make but they were they don't trust anybody else to do it for us that's simple um this question comes from richard warner mr buffett has espoused for decades the philosophy of buy and hold or or hold forever was too short of a time period is it a misperception on my part or has his philosophy changed it seems to be a much greater turnover in the equity portfolio lately i don't think there's that much turnover i mean but no but there's too much what there's way too much <laughs> yeah the, it's still too much it's, it's yeah. the same amount yeah <laughs> I, 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 yeah I, i'd agree with that and uh, and the, the truth is we own our businesses are equities so we own 400 or 500 billion and you know, maybe more in businesses we don't we don't turn them over at all we don't resell businesses we we could probably well we won't even get into that what we could do but we we don't do it and uh uh and we we do relatively little and the charlie says we do better if we if not if we if i done much <laughs> So that's about the uh, that's uh, more about uh, that they do not really sell stocks and they have not uh, sold a lot of companies where they own minority share like Coca Cola they have not sold it at the top and then buy it again. So that is a very important learning lesson that if you are bullish on the business in the long run there is no need to sell. Now last two points this one is a business lesson and how to increase the business how to grow the business and. they talked about decentralization along with the right work culture so two things are important decentralization he says that i am the only probably i only ceo on snp 500 which does not call for monthly income statement one and he said this works with the right work culture so let's let's listen to him and then we go to the inflation outlook purchasing share so our shareholders own more of those companies uh every year while we're if assuming we're repurchasing shares which is price sensitive Charlie yeah, yeah I I don't think uh, we're getting too big to manage because we're different from practically every other big corporation in the United States in that we are so excessively decentralized we have decentralized so much and we have so much authority in the subsidiaries that we can keep doing it for a long long time as long as it keeps working and i would say so far that our decentralization has caused more benefits than defects but nobody seems to copy us well but that's but, absolutely true but i would say this decentralization won't work unless you have the right kind of culture accompanying it yeah but we do yeah we do but And Greg is on it. And I mean, Greg will and Greg, Greg will keep the calls through the doors and clear doors aren't closing. Some mono shareholders meeting. We had a, a culture. Uh, Bakshar. People 
Look sure that way. Make all the money for themselves in the next five years at the top. It would not have worked. No, of course not. And the culture is part of it. But assuming we keep the culture, it will it can yeah. go on qu quite a ways for a long, long time. Long, long time. Heck, it may amaze everybody. And by the way, the Roman Empire worked worked as long as it did because it was so decentralized. Charlie says to me, you won't know. Yeah. <laughs> so the good thing is that, uh, you know, a, a billionaire at the age of 89 and 94 are cracking jokes. And at the same time, they said Roman Empire was also decentralized. So I think this made me curious to understand how Roman Empire worked and what was the history. I think history has a lot of lesson to teach us. And here they're saying that decentralization has worked for them as a right to work culture. And this is something a very, very interesting uh, provoking thought. By the way, I'll tell you, if you get time, here to the four hours of, of the whole thing, hear them 10 times. I'm telling you the kind of learning you'll have, whether it is business or investment or work culture and, and how to do the, do the succession planning. I'm reading the books also on Warren Buffett's essay. They are, they are, they are timeless wisdoms. The last topic of today, and then I have an interesting announcement for you and I will take some questions also. The inflation outlook, the, the dragon of inflation is out. I think lumber prices have become three times. Oil, I, I'm sure you all are pinching, are getting the pinch of uh, filling an oil tank. I have Alexis and I think 170, 160 dollars. Deram is taking for, uh, for a full auto tank. Yesterday a client was complaining that I think the petrol prices have reached 100 rupees in, in, in India. And uh, let's look at the, what these people have to say about the inflation outlook. So the last thing today. This question comes for, from Kevin Young. It's for Ajit and Greg. Warren spends his days reading and his literature of choice is annual reports. How do each of you spend your days? What do you, re what do you read and how do you review investment decisions? So pardon me for a second. I think this is starting here at 4.33, yeah. <laughs> I will ask this question from Chris Freed from Philadelphia and whoever wants to take this on stage. From raw material purchases by Berkshire subsidiaries, are you seeing signs of inflation beginning to increase? Let me answer that. Uh, uh, Greg can get more. We're seeing very substantial inflation. It's very interesting. I mean, it, it, we're raising prices. People are raising prices to us. Uh, and it's being accepted. I mean, it's not, uh, if we get, well, you know, take home building. I mean, uh, you know, the cost of, we've got nine home builders and uh, in addition to our manufactured housing thing and then uh, operation, which is the largest in the country. So we really do a lot of housing. <laughs> the costs are just up, up, up. Steel costs, uh, you know, just every day uh, they're, they're going up. And that, it, there, there hasn't yet been because the wage the wage stuff follows. I mean, if the, the UAW writes a three-year contract, we got a three-year contract. But if you're buying steel at General Motors uh, or someplace, you're paying more every day. Uh, so uh, it's it's an economy really, uh, it's red hot. I mean, and we weren't expecting it. I mean, all our companies, when they th they thought when, when they were allowed to go back to work, you know, at, at uh, uh, for various operations, they would, we closed the furniture stores. I mentioned, you know, if they were closed for six weeks or so on average, and they didn't know what was going to happen when they when they opened. And you know that they, they can't stop people from buying things, and we can't deliver them. And they say, well, that's okay because nobody else can deliver them either, and we'll wait for three months or something of the sort. But the backlog grows, and then we thought it would end when the six hundred dollar payments ended, and I think you know around August of last year it just kept going and it, it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and i get the figures every week i call or bump calls me and we go over day by day what happened at three different stores in chicago and kansas city and dallas and and it just won't stop uh people have money in their pocket and and they pay the higher prices and and when prices go up 
in a month or two, you know, we announced a price increase for April for our costs are going up. Supply chain is all screwed up, you know, for all kinds of people. But it's a buy, it's almost a buying frenzy, except certain areas you can't buy it. You, you know, you really can't buy international air travel. And there's uh, so the money is being diverted from a little, from a piece of the economy into the rest. And everybody's got more cash in their pocket than, except for, meanwhile, you know, it's a terrible situation for a percentage of the people. The, you know, this suit, I haven't worn a suit, you know, for a year practically. And that means that the dry cleaner nurse just went out of business. I mean, that nobody's bringing in suits uh, to get dry clean. And nobody's, nobody's bringing in white shirts uh, to get the uh, uh, place where my wife goes. Uh, it, the, the small business person, if you didn't have takeout and delivery services for restaurants, you got killed. On the other hand, if you've got takeout facilities, you've done, you know, same source sales of Dairy Queen are up a whole lot and they adapted them. But it's, it, it, it is not a price sensitive economy right now in the least. And uh, I don't know exactly how one shows up in different price indices, but there's, there's more inflation going on than quite a bit more inflation going on than people would have anticipated of just six months ago or thereabouts. Yeah, and there's one very intelligent man who thinks it's dangerous. And that's just the start. Greg, you probably are in a good position. Yeah, you know, well, when I think you touched on it, I mean, when we look at steel prices, timber prices, any petroleum input, you know, fundamentally there's pressure on those uh, raw materials. I do think something you've touched on, Warren, and it, it, it goes really back to the raw materials. There's a scarcity of product right now of certain raw materials. It's impacting price and the ability to deliver the end product. But, you know, that scarcity factor is is also real out there right now as, as our businesses address that challenge. And it may be the some of that's contributed or uh, arisen from the uh, storm we previously discussed in Texas. When you take down that many petrochemical plants in one state that the rest of the country is very dependent upon it, we're seeing it flow through both on price but overall in scarcity of product, which obviously go together. But uh, there's there's challenges, that's for sure. This question comes from BJ Corala. What do you think of quants? Jim Sai. So now I'm going to answer to your question, which you have asked me, guys. Today's session on the AGM of Berkshire Hathaway 2021 ends here in terms of listening to them. The question which has been asked to me, Sachin, you there? Sachin? Yeah, Bowen, I'm here. Please the go question ahead. you have asked, I will read out for everybody. The question he has asked that the surplus and thus increasing in the inflation and the overvaluation of the stock. Don't you think that, Bowen, this will lead to the surplus and thus increasing the inflation and overvaluation of the stocks? So if you hear him out clearly, he said that the prices are going up, but people have got more money and it is accepted to them until it is a and it comes to a point where people are refusing to buy, that's okay. Now the two things here we need to understand that stocks which are great are in a position to pass on the, in, in the increased cost to the consumer, like a good freight company or a shipping company or a company like Amazon or uh, Skechers and all, they can pass on the cost to you or Netflix or Google or Amazon, they can pass on the cost to you. So right now it is accepted people are ready to pay the higher cost because there is supply disruption. So a lot of aviation companies have not even come in function like India is totally closed. When the India will again come and open and they will have a huge demand and then again there will be a more bottleneck on the logistics side and the prices will go further high. That will lead the stock market go further high and then eventually there will be a point where people will refuse to buy and they will un be unable to afford it. And that's the time you might have a stock overvaluation. So that's my interpretation of what Warren Buffet is saying. But right now, stocks are not overvalued. That's what I have understood. Yeah. I uh, welcome your questions. And then I have an announcement for the next session. I'm very excited about it. But let's take your questions. Yes, Sachin, I totally agree with you. 
thanks bhuvan uh, that was wonderful uh, i do agree like as uh, like even if you see uh, what i was trying to imply is even the back end uh, features like nvidia uh, production of chips and uh, yeah. what is that uh, these things like if you see the stocks have rallied right from 540 and something in march to 700 uh, right now i think it's yeah it's gone up quite a bit yes. so it's it's going to be passed on to the end consumer in some way or the other and like now what apple has reached the stagnation something will happen and it's very challenging to realize when that stagnation would happen <laughs> and what needs to be done at that time no so i think sachin you need to also handle your own perception of i don't know how many of have seen 10 bagger or 5 bagger or 6 bagger to to me if a stock has run 10 times and i'm buying it today it really doesn't make a difference for me what has happened last uh, one year or two year so when i i own this company which has already you know become six seven times in my portfolio it doesn't really make a difference for me unless and until the the financials does not support it now when i look at the financials of a company which i am owning right now the financials are logged in i have a visibility for next two quarter because all the ship charters are a long term business so you have a predictability in the business now if i do not have a predictability then i totally take your point that but i think it is a perception issue i'll tell you a lot of investors in my portfolio they like feel like i'm making 300000 dollar what do you think should we sell it i said sir you sell it if you want to sell the portfolio but they have never seen uh, you know this kind of profit 30 40% in a, a continuous two years they have not seen it so i think sachin you need to read books now and whether apple will go but i can tell you i have not shared with you but if you listen to the uh, bakshar hathwe agm they are very very bullish on apple very true buen and in fact i did make that mistake with wipro i did sell it <laughs> when i made almost 50% profit but then i see it's still rallying up yeah, yeah uh, that's one thing buen uh, another one more question for you with respect to your last webinar uh, on interactive brokers uh i did see a lot of insider shares being sold off any particular reason okay so uh, first of all you need to know how much he owns so he owns roughly 80% of the company and he decided to he's 70 years old now and he's passed on the baton to milan galic so i think let's give it to the old guy uh, he in fact the biggest problem was he was not letting the stock uh, have a good float so he's going to sell roughly uh, i think uh, uh, i forgot the amount but 3 billion dollar somebody uh, rashid also asked me i think earlier so 3 billion dollar is a very small amount in uh, his kitty he still owns roughly uh, 77% of the company so it is nothing else so remember peter lynch lines here uh, they people sell stocks for various reasons the insiders sell the stock for various reasons but they buy only for one reason to make money so there's nothing no nothing alarming here thanks buen yeah i was um, watching it closely yeah. thanks nothing alarming here yeah uh can can we have other questions and sachin you more most welcome to have a zoom set up with me and or a whatsapp and we can take more questions there let's hear if some people have other questions one thing sachin i can tell you that don't come in front of a speeding train a speeding bullet train so there's a very uh, good saying that i think you have come between wipro and your wipro growth you have all, you have come so please don't come in between a speeding bullet train let the train run <laughs> thanks thanks yeah. rashid you had a question earlier you know ask again so if we do not have any question let me share what i want to share with you hey hey uh, bhuvan Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. So look, I guess the question was we we touched upon that interest rates are going to go up, or likely to go up. Inflation is happening. I think you kind of covered, right? It's happened. Think... Uh, it has happened all the time. Whenever we have free money, we will do stupidity. We will will basically do a lot of take a stupid decisions. We will buy properties in Dubai like crazily. We are buying now again off plan properties. <laughs> so we will be stupid. Uh, we will do game stop things we'll do meme stock and i don't understand what is that meme meme stock we will buy more bitcoins uh, free money is always a problem so if you look at the long long interest rate cycle it's every time has gone down gone up gone down gone up whenever you will be given free money i'll give you a very simple analogy to this vishal tulsian one of the prominent investor in the private equity space 
he runs a company called Motla Rosfal Private Equity. Good friend of mine. And he says a very good thing that when an investee company raises more than the money required, they always doom. What does that mean is if you need $50 million and if you raise more than that, that particular money will be wasted because you have no plan for it. You're not prepared for it. Similarly, if I get more money, if I get more money and I really do not know, I don't have a plan. My mind cannot concept conceptualize it, whether I get it from Fed or I get it from the shareholders or I get it as a money printing or a profit, I'm going to take bad decisions. So interest rate will eventually rise. There is no two doubt about it. Got it. Thank you. Any question you have on the follow-up question or something? I think Krifton has a question. Is cryptocurrency a generation mindset? We see young successful people. I think you have a uh, you have a successful investor from Singapore itself who made some $60 billion or something. Yes, so so Clifton, you know, I'm an old guy now. You can see my hair are getting gray. <laughs> so I have no uh, no comments on cryptocurrency right now. But I think I have too much to learn on the stock market itself right now. So I will give it a pause. Mark Zuckerberg is, I think, younger than me and richer than me. And he has he can do uh, all he wants. But I want to give you one uh, uh, heads up. Cryptocurrency is all about, so not cryptocurrency. Uh, yeah, cryptocurrency is all about speed and the cost saving. The only challenge is it is not a government thing. And currency, whatever we have heard till date, is always a government thing. It's always a centralized thing. So even gold is money, but not currency. So money and currency is a huge difference. So if crypto is going to be a trading tool, fine. But crypto is, if crypto wants to become a currency, that's a big challenge. So whether it is Mark Zuckerberg talking about Libra or whatever, I have, I, in fact, Jim Rogers from Singapore, who's a, uh, one of the richest commodity investor, has his own doubt that cryptocurrency can become a successful currency. So there is no issue with cryptocurrency being a trading commodity, uh, asset maybe, but it might not be a currency. And if it, because it is fluctuating very highly. Now, transparency has to be brought one day because there might be money laundering involved. So with these two parameters, Clifton, I think the asset valuation is a big key here. So this is what I will say that I would like to not take this as an investment vehicle as of now. Do we have any other question? I'm very happy to take the question. Okay, so I think you saw the AGM of 2021. There are various AGMs which has happened and recorded. Uh, they happen in Omaha. I'll again request the honor request to all of you that next year, if you are okay to travel and Corona is not there, I will meet you there. Uh, you will meet a lot of people there. Even Tim Cook goes there as the Apple CEO. Uh, it's a great place to learn. Uh, this goes for a longer time. I think because of the online, it is happening for a lower time. Uh, it is not that we can't get that knowledge on Zoom and save money. But I think when you are physically there, and that atmosphere is there and you're not distracted, the, the, the knowledge which fits into our mind is the highest. And you also learn from a lot of people who are there. So I will, have a, I will again request all of you, go with your son, go with your daughter, go with your wife. I will also help you to tell you how you can organize the, the trip when the time comes. Now, my next announcement is I'm going to come live with Mr. Vijay Kedia. I don't know how many of you know that Vijay Kedia. Let me tell you about Mr. Vijay Kedia. Mr. Vijay Kedia is a stock investor and he is very famous to manage his own money and he's owner of Kedia Securities, a very down-to-earth guy. The session is going to be in Hindi. Uh, he talks a very layman language and you, you should be asking your questions in advance to me. Uh, it will be a Zoom webinar or a YouTube webinar and not a Zoom meeting. Let me introduce Vijay Kedia here. And uh, he... Uh, made I think thousand crore uh, some years ago. Today he is worth I think three thousand crore worth. So this is Mr. Vijay Kedia. Uh, if you can see this video, and Mr. Vijay Kedia is 
as i repeat is a very simple man he has spoken in i am his spoken into prestigious college uh, no degree he has what i know of no, not a very fancy uh, fancy degree he has spoken in i am bangalore he does not manage anybody's money he's also spoken on tedx in the sb international school and let's listen to his his song for a minute whenever the stock market goes uh, uh, out of the flavor he writes song they are very meaningful song if you can understand hindi aap yadi hindi samajh sakte hain to ye gaane apne aap mein bahut bada wisdom hai meri 8 uh, saal ki beti hai i have a 7 year, uh, 8 years old daughter and she has understood stock market because of vijay kedia ji and whenever we go in the car she wants to listen to him so just let's hear for a minute or two uh, in july any particular date we will tell you and i request tell your uh, spouse tell your children to join on zoom webinar because i think this is one of one of the lifetime opportunity where he's agreed to uh, come online and take your questions i will be uh, uh, prompting you again and again for questions and i will take down the right questions i'm going to ask vijay kedia to make you a better investor that's our mission let's listen to the song for a minute अपनी विजय के लिए सुन अपने विजय की धुन जिंदगी थाउजन पहुंची गया ये लाख की जर्नी शुरू हुई है फिर भी अपने होश न खोना चाहे पार्टी शुरू हुई है फिर भी अपने होश न खोना चाहे पार्टी शुरू हुई है समझा गया मामू फिर भी अपने होश न खोना चाहे पार्टी शुरू हुई so he is mr vijay kedia guys we coming live with him next month i think if you have any question on him you can ask but else let's park all the questions go ahead and listen to him on youtube learn from him and next month when we meet uh, you are more than welcome to ask uh, him questions i will ask the question on your, on your behalf and i think that will be a significant boost in your investing journey my investing journey with that uh, i think we have taken one and a half hour of yours thanks for joining thanks to client first asian client first capital team for organizing such a wonderful webinar uh, the recording will be sent to you at a later stage uh, looking forward to make you money looking forward to help you to some money education thank you and have a great day and have a great evening in singapore and i think yeah thank you thank you priya for uh, for organizing this yeah thanks bhuvan great session Um, priya you got uh, the uh, details of the people who have attended and all got the names bhuvan yes names right you i think yes. uh, i know uh, many of them maybe mr fernando i don't know and one no, other i don't know i asked for his name i haven't received a reply mr fernando if you are there can you could you just um, identify yourself mr chandrakant valabdas like he is attending for the first time uh If you either of you have any questions, you can ask. Or I think they have logged on and then then they yeah, have. Yeah, uh, Mr. Fernando is replying. Okay. Glad sir. Please talk to him uh, on the chat itself. No problem, and just ask him if he is interested to take it. Ahead. Well, he's from Nigeria. Wow. Yeah, okay. So, Mr. Fernando would have been referred referred by Mr. Anand Somaya. Ask for the email address and mobile number so we can add him through the mailer list.
Welcome, Mr. Fernando. Nice that you could join us. Could you just give your email ID and mobile number? Do you know Ms. Chandrakan also, Priya? Chandrakan Vallabdas? Yeah, I spoke to him. Uh, he's joined from his phone. And he's from which city? Here, Dubai. Oh. I think Chandrakan is a friend of Nishakarji or something. I, I know. He's... Uh... No, no. He's uh, been receiving the TFTs and so he's joined. Mr. Fernando, could you share your email ID and mobile number? We haven't received it yet. So I think I've got it. He registered it. So don't worry. I have it. Okay. okay. And he gave the number. Oh, Great. Yeah. So Mr. Have... Chandrakant, actually, I think uh, he's been receiving TFTs. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, he sent the mail ID. Yeah, I've already got it here. So okay. I think there is, I just saw the hub spot. So there are a lot of uh, people are now joining from Nigeria. I think it's got late. And uh, so no problem. I'll pass it on to you. So, Priya, let's talk again. Uh, I'll give you the... Uh, yeah, so, Mr. Fernando, we have your mobile number. Do you think you've registered it? Or I'll take it from Anand, Anandji and, and speak to you. 